I am Michael Severo, an interviewer for the Oral History Project of the Berkeley Historical Society. Today, Wednesday, April 27th, 2022, I am with Anna Rapkin in Berkeley, where we are going to conduct this oral history on Zoom. Good afternoon, Anna. In 1963, you moved to Berkeley from San Francisco. Um, can you tell us where you moved? Actually, we moved to the Albany married student housing because my um, husband went back to the university to get his master's degree and um, the university made available a very nice apartment. We were very fortunate because Albany married student housing initially uh, during World War II was basically barracks for soldiers of the military. So one part of the village, because it was quite large, was really, really shabby housing with walls like a paper. But we were in the new section, which had just been built. So we had a brand new apartment and a very nice um, unit which was built around the courtyard and uh, shortly after we moved there I had my first baby my daughter and uh, when I went back to work uh, I hired a babysitter and um, she was able to take my baby down into this courtyard with all the other mothers or babysitters so it was a perfect um, set up for us because my husband could go to the university, I went to work and the baby was taken care of uh, in a very nice setting. Did you uh, meet people there that um, you maintain contact with afterwards? We, we made a couple of friends. Uh, we didn't have very much time because my husband did a two-year program in one year and I was working. So um, we had social friends, but not anybody that we kept up with after we left. Now, after you moved out of the married student housing, you purchased a house in Berkeley. Yes. Uh, <laughs> what, what is the story of that? We were very fortunate because um, my adoptive mo mother um, owned a property on Staten Island, which she um, left to me. And of course, once we moved out of New York, that property was just empty. It was a little shack <laughs> on a couple of lots. Uh, not too far from the beach in Staten Island. And my adoptive father had absolutely no use for the property, so nobody used it. So eventually we decided to sell it. And with the proceeds from that sale, we were able to buy a house in the Berkeley Hills for $28,000. <laughs> <laughs> That was a lot of money then. <laughs> it was a lot of money. And my husband's brother, who was a professor at Berkeley, uh, was horrified that I, we paid so much money. And my father in New York was aghast that we decided, if we were going to stay in California, that we decided to live in Berkeley rather than San Francisco. <laughs> You're still living in that house? Yes. Very when changed, you... as you can imagine, but it's yeah. still the same house. I sort of feel like the dinosaur of <laughs> the street. <laughs> Practically everybody else has left. Mm.
Uh, when you moved to Berkeley, a lot was happening politically in the nation. The anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, uh, the year you moved, uh, Betty Friedan wrote her feminine mystique. Uh, there was student activism, assassinations. How did all of this affect you? The JFK assassination was, uh, I mean, we were just aghast. Uh, we couldn't believe that it had happened. Um, I had become a U.S. citizen shortly before the assassination, and I had been looking forward very much to my first presidential vote, uh, which was not to be. Uh, so I think the following assassinations uh, were I mean, they were shocking, but I think the JFK assassination was just because it was the first that I was aware of uh, and somebody that I actually had seen personally um, at close quarters, uh, it just seemed unbelievable. Uh, the, Martin Luther King, uh, it was, um, it, it seemed like all the things that we believed in were sort of going down the drain with his assassination. And then uh, Robert Kennedy, because it happened in Los Angeles and we were watching on television, uh, each one of them had tremendous impact on us. How about the uh, political issues of civil rights and the anti-war movement? And well, my the... my husband was very much involved um, in the civil rights movement. Uh, when he was a teenager, he went to the ethical culture schools in um, New York, and so, and the ethical culture schools were very much in the forefront of the civil rights movement. Uh, so he had a tradition of uh, keeping up with what was happening. So he was very involved with the um, picketing of Mao's drive-in and various other places. I was home with babies, <laughs> mm. so I was not as active as he was. Um, we both got involved in the anti-war movement and went to a lot of uh, peace marches with the children. Um, and because he was working as a volunteer for KPFA uh, during the FSN on campus, free speech movement on campus, he was very much uh, part of what was going on on campus. He was taping when Joan Baez came and so on. Um, the only time that I was part of a big demonstration um, had to do with People's Park, and uh, I was asked by a, a phone tree to participate and to go and demonstrate for People's Park, which I did. And that was the day when the Alameda County Sheriff's attack the demonstrators killed one person, blinded another. We were lucky to get away because we were caught in a gas attack um, as were 
hundreds, if not thousands, of other people. So that was my um, um, experience with violence mm -hmm. by the sheriffs, deputies, and sheriff, sheriffs. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there were a lot of uh, other marches uh, because. Berkeley was put under military rule, really, by Governor Reagan. Uh, there were curfews, you couldn't go out, the helicopters were uh, buzzing over our heads all the time. Uh, it was very, very unpleasant for a couple, of months, a couple of weeks. And because of I had small children, I didn't go out. Did you feel like you were back in pre-war or wartime Europe? Well, when I went down to People's Park and I saw the, the sheriffs in their big boots and all the armaments, uh, it really did feel very much like the German Gestapo um, surrounding us in the ghetto. Um, and they were very violent. In your memoir, you mentioned uh, after you moved into your house, you met other women at a tot lot. Uh, which one or where was that? Uh, can you tell us about your experiences there? Well, um, I, I was an urban child, so I never lived in a house. So when we bought this house, um, I was amazed that we had a backyard and so on. And the real estate agent told me, oh, you'll be so happy to know that uh, just a few houses down the street, there's the Terrace View Park. And I thought, oh, well, why would I need a park? I have a backyard. <laughs> the children can play outside. But as uh, my, ch my first child became a toddler, that little park, Terrace View Park, became a godsend to me because I was so isolated at home by myself with a child. And I was pretty soon pregnant with my second child. So, and I didn't know anybody in Berkeley. So the, the women, and it was all women that I met at the park, were really the only people that I had any communication with during the day. And they were very interesting women, and we all had small children. So in no time at all, we had organized a babysitting co-op so that we could have some time off during the week and do errands and so on. Very quickly, we organized a, um, um, we lobbied City Hall to put up a fence because the top lot was not fenced in, and uh, to have signs put up. And then we lobbied the East Bay Regional Park District to have one of the ranges uh, lead top walks in, the, in Tilden Park, and they, our children love that because um, the ranger, Tim Gordon, who led these walks, was so wonderful with small children, and they learned so much about nature. He made it so much fun for them. So they always remembered Ranger Tim <laughs> for the rest of their lives. Did, did you... Um... Talk about your past with these these women. No, I didn't. Um, hmm. We pretty much focused on our children, on, hmm. uh, 
on the houses, how we were trying to keep things going, uh, places to take our children, on what was happening with the school district, because this was during the uh, campaign to integrate the schools. Um, so, no, it was um, one of the good things about, um, for me, about this group was that nobody cared where I came from, what religion I was, what my past was, what I had done or hadn't done. Um, the big difference between me and the rest of the group is everybody had a college degree except me. And they couldn't believe that I hadn't gone to college. <laughs> so that was uh, a big difference. Now, you mentioned in your memoir, you, uh, your first election was to be PTA president. Can you uh, tell us about your first campaign? <laughs> Well, the, uh, the mothers at the, law, at the park were constantly talking about how important it was to get involved in the school dis district um, with, through the PTA. And they persuaded me to join the PTA. And the school that our children were going to go to was Hillside School, which was right down the hill uh, from us. Um, about a mile and a half. And according to the plan was our children were going to get picked up by buses and bus down to the school. And the children from West Berkeley were going to be picked up in West Berkeley and bussed up to Hillside School. So they persuaded me to go to the planning meeting during the summer uh, to plan for the first year of kindergarten through third grade integration at Hillside School. I was very reluctant to go because I felt that they were so much more knowledgeable than I was, but I did go. And during that meeting, which took place in the Hillside Library, and there were about 30 women, no men, all white, none of the black parents came. And they had an election for the PTA board, and all the positions were filled until they came to the president. And nobody, would raise their hand and say, okay, I'll, I'll be the president. So there was this horrible silence in the room. And the woman who had been sort of the instigator of the meeting said, well, we can't have a PTA unless we have a president. So if somebody doesn't volunteer, this whole thing is gonna fall apart. Well, I had no idea that this was a guilt tripping <laughs> tactic. So I was so horrified that, you know, all of this would fall apart that I said, well, I think my husband will be able to do it. And they said, oh, that's great. <laughs> Voted in by acclamation. So I went home and I said to my husband, yes, who was elected president of the PTA? And he said, congratulations. And I said, no, 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 <laughs> it's you. <laughs> well, needless to say, he was horrified. <laughs> but I persuaded him that I would do all the work and that he would be just the titular <laughs> president. So that's how it came about. And um, I was very involved. The first thing that we decided to do was to have this huge camp out in Tilden Park for all the children at Hillside School, which was about 200 children, um, to allow 
the children and some of the parents to get together over a weekend and get to know each other outside of a school setting to help uh, the integration process. Well, it turned out to be quite difficult because a lot of the children didn't have sleeping bags, they didn't have tents, mm -hmm. so we had to borrow things and mm -hmm. create <laughs> sleeping bags out of blankets and all sorts of things, but we did it. And we ordered a lot of hamburgers and hot dogs. And the day, the morning of the camp, it poured. It absolutely poured. And there was no way that we could possibly take 200 children into a mud field. So we sat on the telephones and just canceled it. <laughs> so that was <laughs> our big failure. Uh, but I think the PTA was um, helpful. Um, we started a lot of after-school activities. Unfortunately, a lot of the children from West Berkeley did not um, stay after school because the parents were nervous about allowing their children to stay. So. So, uh, it was a learning experience. Women in the uh, tot group, tot uh, lot group, uh, were surprised you did not have a college education. So uh, tell us the story of your, your decision to go to college and what you decided to major in and study. So um, again, it was a telephone tree <laughs> that got me uh, into college. And the way it happened was the Peralta School District decided to close the only uh, community college which was in the western part of the district. That college was on what is now MLK uh, near Children's Hospital. It used to be Grove Street and the college was called Grove Street College. And Peralta Trustees decided to build a college up in the hills, which is now Merritt College. So the telephone tree um, uh, was activated in order to get as many white um, students to sign up to enroll at Grove Street College to try and keep it open. So I, thinking I was doing my civic duty to keep the college open, enrolled at Grove Street College. Um, at that point, my children were um, in first grade. So I had, or the youngest child was in first grade. So I had from nine o'clock until about two that I had to myself. So I took as many classes as I could um, put into that time period. And I just loved going to these classes. And uh, much to my surprise, I was doing really well. I was always on the dean's list and so on. So I kept going. Um, needless to say, we did not save the college. But after two years of attending, uh, my counselor at the college said, you know, with your grades, which were pretty much straight, um, um, you can transfer to UC Berkeley. So I thought, well, why 
why not? I, I'm enjoying being a college student. So that's what I did. And um, when I was looking at the various majors, nothing really stood out for me. And um, <clears throat> somebody suggested that I go to the women's center on the campus, which I did. Uh, to see what I could do. And they told me that UC had recently started an independent major, so you could build your own major. And they suggested that I get in touch with Professor Arlie Hochschild, who could help me, which I did. And she was wonderful. She said, look, just look at what really interests you. What what are you interested in? And build a curriculum by just picking the classes that you know fulfill what your interests are. So I told her, you know, I'm really interested in urban uh, affairs. And I was like, okay, there are lots of classes that will fit that. So that's what I did. Um, and so I became the first urban studies major um, for Berkeley. And um, in 2002, there was actually an urban studies major made you know, part of what people could major in. And from that, getting an undergraduate degree in urban studies, I decided to go on to graduate school in city and regional planning. So that's where I got my master's. Um, so when you went there um, to, to UC Berkeley, uh, you were probably a little bit older than most of the other students, weren't you? And so um, I was... Um, over 40 when I went to graduate school. And um, I was terrified of taking the GRE because I really, I had never taken, you know, those type of exams. But um, I had been elected by Baker Kappa as an undergraduate. And so a friend of mine said, just submit your application with the Phi Beta and see what happens. And then she called me and said she was on the admissions committee and they had voted um, to put me, they had one slot for a returning woman. Um, so I was an affirmative action um, enrollee at the age of 40. In the graduate program. And when I was an undergraduate, I had worked, well, I had, I had one of the classes I took required that I intern in a political office. And uh, I had interned with the only uh, council member that I knew, um, who was Lonnie Hancock, because my husband and I had worked on um, Ron Dellums' first congressional um, campaign, and we had met Lonnie through that, and then we had worked on her campaign, uh, the first one that she didn't win, and then the second one that she did win. So um, I interned in her office, which was on Channing Way and Telegraph, right close to the university, so I could go between classes uh, to, her, to her office and help out. And um, her chief of staff at that time was a man by the name of David Bunstock. And he said, well, what, what interests you? And I said, well, I'm really interested in public transit. He said, okay, so you can work on public transit. Well, uh, it turned out that I worked a little bit on this, a little bit on that, but I got a really good feeling about what her office was trying to do. So when I graduated, 
um, an age of men, months of left because Steve has graduated from law school and got a legal business. And Bonnie hired me as her chief of staff. So right after I graduated, I started working full time in City Hall with Lonnie. And um, I found it really, really interesting. Uh, I got to know a lot of city administrators, city staff, and of course, a lot of the constituents who were coming to her office constantly. So when Florence McDonald decided to retire from the position of city auditor, and run for the city council, uh, a couple of people said, uh, why don't you, I had, my interest was in program evaluation, that was the focus of my graduate studies. People suggested that I might consider running for city auditor. And so I talked to Florence and she said, well, yeah, I'm perfect. Uh, and she supported me. So that's how it came about that in 1979, I ran the city auditor, much to my surprise. <laughs> when you were working for uh, Lonnie, uh, this is, let's see, there were several things. You were uh, on the Daily Californian board. Um, the Daily Californian uh, now was interning in the Channing office was one floor above us. Mm. They were in the same building. So there was a lot of back and forth between Daily California staff and reporters in our office. So I got to know people at the Daily California. Um, and when there was a board vacancy, one of the board members reached out to me and asked whether I'd be interested in serving on the board. And I went back and forth, never having served on a board before, <laughs> and not quite sure what I could do. Um, but then I talked to the editor and decided I could do what the board was doing, so, which was basically developing the policy uh, parameters for the newspaper and also helping with the finances. And the Daily Californian at the time was in pretty bad shape. And since I had gotten to know our assemblyman, Tom Bates, I reached out to him and he helped uh, with some of the financial problems they were having. Hmm. Uh, it was a very strange board <laughs> because uh, there were a lot of students on the board and so there was a lot of turnover and uh, a lot of pot smoking during the board meetings. <laughs> Uh, so it was pretty chaotic, but they got the newspaper out on a daily basis. It was quite amazing. Uh, your husband was, what, the business manager? When I was elected to office, I was uh, resigned from the board. But at that point, um, the newspaper was looking for a manager. Mm. And my husband had been very uh, interested in communications. He had a communications degree from San Francisco State. And so I said to him, would you be interested? 
Mm-hmm. He thought it'd be sort of fun. <laughs> um, and it was for him. Uh, he, he really enjoyed um, modernizing the newspaper because when he took over, first of all, the newspaper uh, left the Channing office and took offices on Shabbat Square, right above University Avenue. Um, he, um, and they were still typing on typewriters, you know, and he uh, instituted, computerized the whole operation very early on uh, and made huge differences in the way the newspaper was printed and so on. So he he really enjoyed that aspect of it, of the um, modernization of the operations. What he did not enjoy was having to deal with the board. <laughs> and after a couple of years, he resigned. Tell us about uh, your experience with the uh, uh, EBMUD. Yes, um, it was the Blue Ribbon Committee, and each city had three appointees on the committee. So every city in the district had three appointees. I was appointed by Helen Burke, who was the board member of EDMUD from Berkeley, and there were two other people from Berkeley. And our task was to look at the finances of EFMAN during a period of drought because their revenue their revenues had gone down significantly because of conservation. The less water people use, the less revenue the district gets. So the task before this committee was to um, evaluate how water was being charged in the various parts of the district, whether it was equitable, and whether there were any new ways of bringing in revenue to the district. So we came up with a report. I think we met for two years, once a month. And we had staff from the Edmund district helping us. And we came up with a report showing how unequitable, inequitable the uh, structure was, changes to be considered. And also we came up with some suggestions for new um, revenue streams. The Berkeley group, the three of us, suggested that the district could put up um, wind power on the on their land to create electricity and sell the electricity to PG&E. Well, we are pretty much laughed out of the committee <laughs> for making that suggestion. But you have to remember this was in 1980, 81, something like that, where the idea of wind power was considered very radical. Tell us about your involvement with the uh... BCA, the Berkeley Citizen Action. How did you get involved with that? And Actually, um, we got involved um, through the April Coalition, which was a predecessor, predecessor of BCA um, and ran the campaign for Lonnie's first election mm-hmm. in 1969. And then it morphed into BCA, and we just continued being active 
with BCA, um, basically supporting um, people who ran on that slate. Uh, but of course, when I decided to run in 1979, then um, we got much more involved. Uh, so mm -hmm. my husband uh, would go to the steering committee meetings and uh, raise money and stuff like that. Did you hold any position with the BCA vice no, president? I didn't. Um, I didn't hold any position. Um, the only sort of active um, part was when the endorsement process was going on. I was on the endorsement committee, so we voted pro or contra uh, the various candidates. Oh, tell, tell us about your decision to run for the auditor. You mentioned earlier that uh, Florence McDonald deciding to leave opened up a position, but uh, did your experience on the EBMUD and the Daily Cow and working for Lonnie uh, have an impact on your decision and how? Yes, it actually did because, first of all, as I said, my uh, interest, academic interest, was in program evaluation because at that time uh, there was a lot of federal money flowing into cities. And um, working in Lonnie's office, I was always looking at the city budgets and trying to determine how the money was being allocated. And I realized that a lot of the contracts that were um, given to various nonprofits in Berkeley were just given every year. Um, but there was really very little evaluation as to uh, how successful these programs were. So as long as they were legal, they complied with the legal requirements uh, because the federal money had to be audited and the uh, auditor's office audited those contracts for legality and for financial compliance. But they never really looked at what did they achieve? Were they serving the purpose that they were supposed to? And with my program evaluation, background, academic background, I thought that was really very important to look at. And the Comptroller General of the United States had come out with what's called the Yellow Book, which is the Bible for both federal, state, and local auditors. And in that new reiteration, um, he really encouraged auditors at all levels to look at effectiveness, efficiency, and equity. So that gave me the uh, possibility to say, look, besides just looking at legal compliance and financial uh, compliance, let's look at what's actually being done. Um, very, very few audit offices were doing that. Uh, so Berkeley was one of the first to start doing performance audits. Mm. It was extremely hard to do because, first of all, uh, most auditors were not um, trained to do that. Second of all, politically, it was very unpopular uh, because uh, the agencies that got these contracts, <laughs> as you can imagine, were not particularly keen to have somebody looking at uh, how successful they were or not. Um, and a lot of politicians were not very happy because a lot of them had pet projects which they wanted to continue funding. 
So I was very idealistic and naive, <laughs> thinking that, oh yeah, after a year or so, this will just take off. And, well, it took several years to actually be able to do that. And I'm very, very happy that my successor, Anne-Marie Hogan, and now Jenny Wong, have built on that foundation that I started and have taken it way beyond what I was able to do. You, you mentioned earlier that you, um, when you decided to run, there were people in the BCA who recommended that you run. Did, did people urge you not to run? Once I uh, announced that I was running, uh, you know, BCA had uh, two other organizations that it competed against, mm -hmm. which was the Berkeley Democratic Club, and then there was another organ organization called ABC. I forget what that stood for. <laughs> um, and during the endorsement process, uh, I went to each one of the organizations to get an endorsement. And needless to say, um, the Berkeley Democratic Club was not interested in me, and ABC was not interested in me. So they uh, definitely did not endorse me. Although, the Berkeley Democratic Club, a lot of members came to me after the endorsement meeting and said they were sorry that I hadn't gotten endorsed, but they had actually voted for me. So I knew that um, you know, there were people in the Democratic Club who supported me, but the majority did not. And in each case, each one of these organizations had a rule of 60. So you had to get 60%, not just a majority. To get the endorsements, did you, um, uh, you actually went to a meeting and made a presentation? It's, uh, how do those endorsements work or operate? Well, uh, in, in both cases, you had to submit your name and answer questions, a questionnaire, uh, to the steering committee of these organizations. That steering committee then made a decision whether to put your name forward or not. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a public meeting of the membership of each one of these organizations. The BCA, um, the first meeting in 1979 of the BCA membership was huge. There were several hundred people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was endorsed unanimously. The Berkeley Democratic Club, um, the steering committee put forward both names um, and the first candidate that they put forward as their recommendation, um, during that meeting, it, uh, they found out that they, he had a, uh, a criminal issue that, in his past. So they quickly scotched the meeting and went looking for another candidate. So the next week, I think it was, I had to go to another meeting and they had found another candidate and endorsed that candidate. I can't remember what happened with the ABC. Mm -hmm. No, you received other endorsements, uh, Ron Dellums, Tom Bates, there were one or two BART directors, 
the Central Labor Council of Alameda County and numerous individuals. What was the process of getting endorsements from them? Um, the political elected officials like Ron Dellums, Tom Bates, and John George basically endorsed the whole BCA slate. Mm -hmm. So I didn't actually have to go for interviews mm -hmm. with them. Uh, they endorsed the whole slate. Mm -hmm. And the slate had to go, the, um, I think it was the BCA steering committee chair had to go before the Dellums, Bates, and John George steering committee make the presentation on behalf of the slate. Mm -hmm. uh, Alameda uh, Labor Council, I was interviewed by them mm -hmm. and they recommended my endorsement. Mm -hmm. So each one, and then of course I had to go before the editorial boards of various newspapers to get their endorsement or not. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the Gazette said that I was very charming, but unqualified, <laughs> which I thought was such a sexist way of <laughs> putting it. But um, yeah, so it, it varied. Hmm. How about fundraising? You were, uh, how did you raise funds for your campaign? Um, Mostly by uh, mail. I had quite a large mailing list. So I hit up my family and friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we had a couple of uh, fundraising events. Um, one of which you will laugh because it, uh, I decided that it be fun to have a treasure hunt. So we uh, spend hours developing clues for the treasure hunt all over downtown Berkeley. And we set up a table outside of City Hall uh, to, to you know, sell tickets for the treasure hunt. Not a single person came. <laughs> it was a total bust. But uh, we had others which worked a little better. So I, I raised enough money to be able to print my brochure. I just had one brochure and uh, which a friend of mine who was an architect designed for me. And then we had um, what the used to be called cog signs, which are those big signs that are put up on uh, telephone poles and all over mm -hmm. Berkeley. Uh, and I was horrified the first day that I came out because I came out of City Hall and I saw my name in these horrible colors, <laughs> but they were very visible. And the people at the sign company told me, oh, they have really excellent colors. Everybody will see them. Did did, um, did you campaign primarily with the slate from uh, BCA, or did you campaign alone? Or uh, both? Most of the time, I campaigned alone because mm -hmm. I was um, the area that I really had to focus on was the hills, mm -hmm. uh, because I had to get a lot of votes from the hills; otherwise, I couldn't possibly win. So I spent most of my time walking uh, door to door, uh, either with my husband or with a friend. Um, and we had a huge map in our house where we marked all the streets that I had walked. And we figured out that I had walked 100 miles. And if I had actually come face to face with 100 people, it was a lot. But then I also went on campus. I um, did a lot of leafleting on campus. I went, um, I, 
I went on movie lines, uh, mm. bank lines. Uh, I went to all sorts of community events. So I campaigned very assiduously. I spent a lot of time campaigning. So how does it feel campaigning? I, you know, I, hearing this and thinking of your background and your past, you were hesitant, you were shy. This must have been quite a, uh, this is quite a leap. Do you have any thoughts about that, uh, about how, what a contrast it was when you were doing it? Did you think, is, I'm, you know, where, where you started off and now you're doing this? I mean, this, this is really incredible. <laughs> yes, it was, it was uh, very, very scary. That's, I remember the first, um, The first endorsement meeting I went to, I was, I was really terrified. Um, unfortunately, the, the person who was interviewing me was Professor Jack Kent, who was a professor at UC, uh, who I, uh, in um, city and regional planning. So I knew a little bit. I knew him a little bit. Um, and he also had been the first um, city council member elected um, who was a Democrat because the Berkeley City Council originally was Republican. <laughs> and so um, he tried to put me at ease because he saw how how nervous I was. Uh, so that sort of eased me. And of course, uh, BCA process, I knew I was among friends, so that was much easier. The face-to-face -face, um, campaigning, like going to the co-op, standing outside the co-op and leafleting, I found people to be extremely nice. People were really interested. Um, people who stopped and talked to me. And when I did meet somebody at the door, 99% of the people were so happy that somebody made the effort to come to their door that they were very welcoming. So I think it was really because people were so kind and interested that it got me over my fear of um, doing it. What was very, very scary until the very end of my campaign was public speaking, um, going before a large group of people and having to speak. And so when I was elected, and I recognized that I would have to do more public speaking. I joined Toastmasters, which is an organization, an international organization, which basically is focused on getting people over their fear of public speaking, which I learned was not only me, but the vast majority of people. Mm -hmm. And it's a uh, peer run organization totally volunteer, and it just so happened that in downtown Berkeley, they met every Thursday lunchtime at the former health, the state health department building. So every Thursday, religiously, I went uh, to the cafeteria. They had a little space where they met, mm -hmm. and I, um, they have manuals that teach you from the very beginning, very beginner type of speeches, all the way through to very advanced presentations. And I stayed with that program for about, I don't know, seven or eight years. 
So this, um, I, I want to, I noticed that I forgot to ask you one little thing about the influences on your decision to run. Uh, what impact did the women's success teams have on your decision? It had a lot to do with my decision to run. Um, it was just a confidence builder. Mm. Um, it was a, um, a look at what I had already achieved in life and um, that I was able to do things. Uh, and that when I put my mind to it, I usually did things well. So I think that was important for me. So on election night, I, April 17th, 1979, you won uh, that day. Uh, can you tell us about election night? Where were you? Uh, how did you hear about the results? So um, the um, I should start the night before, <laughs> which was um, a huge a BCA did a huge get out the vote effort, mm -hmm. which starts um, you know, early <laughs> in the morning, <laughs> like two or three in the morning. And my whole family went out, and we had uh, we went to the BCA office and we got our get out the vote packet. So we had bags of these packets, and then we were given an area to cover. And of course, it's dark and not particularly pleasant <laughs> walking around, but. We did it, and uh, you hang these slate cards telling people how to vote and where to vote. It shows their polling place. And around six in the morning, it's over, and uh, we all went to all the people who were doing the get out the vote, went to La Pena for breakfast. And some of the people who were involved with BCA cooked this humongous amount of food for, there must have been at least 200 people doing get out the vote. So it was a very communal feeling, you know, getting uh, people uh, together and exchanging stories about what happened. And then we, went home, caught up on sleep if we could, uh, and voted. Um, and then during the day, many of us were on the phone uh, reminding people to vote. Uh, and then uh, a lot of people went to the party at the BCA office. Uh, waiting, you know, for the polls to close. In those days, there were paper ballots, and the paper ballots were counted at Berkeley High. So once the polls closed, a lot of people went to Berkeley High to watch the counting and to be able to call in the results. Um, and the, the, uh, the results uh, went through Alameda County uh, Registrar's Office. So there were people at Berkeley High, and there were people at the Registrar um, voters in Alameda County, and they kept in touch by telephone. And at the BCA office, my husband was the announcer of the 
vote counts as they came in from the registrar's office. So he had this huge blackboard where he would write all the results. I could not stand to be in the office, so I and a couple of other people went to see Chinatown, which was playing in the movie house. And so by the time Chinatown was over, and we came to the BCA office, it must have been around 10 o'clock or so. And people said, oh, you're doing really well. I think you're going to win. And I couldn't believe it because, of course, the totals were not in. But there were some statisticians amongst our group who could figure out statistically what was happening. Well, I, uh, I preferred to believe that I was going to lose and be surprised. <laughs> So, I don't think I really believed that I had won until after midnight. Uh, and the, the difference really was the hills. Uh, but I got more votes in the hills than most BCA slate members. Well, we'll end this session at this point, And the next one will carry your life forward as an auditor of the city of Berkeley. So I uh, really want to thank you for your participation and teaching me a lot about <laughs> Berkeley and uh, its history and uh, getting a real nice feel for what it was like politically uh, in this city.